All right, if you have your Bible, turn to the book of Hebrews, chapter 7 with me this morning, please. <coughs> Hebrews chapter number 7, and verse number 22. Hebrews 7, 22. By so much was Jesus made a surety of a better testament. They truly were many priests because they were not so suffered to continue by reason of death. But this man, because he continueth ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost, that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. For such an high priest became us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens, who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice, first for his own sins, and then for the people's. For this he did once, when he offered up himself. For the law maketh men high priests which have infirmity, but the word of the oath, which was since the law, maketh the Son who is consecrated forevermore. Father, bless this holy book. In thy name I pray, amen. Look at verse number 25. You can be seated. Hebrews chapter number 7 and verse number 25, Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost, that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. I want to preach a message this morning entitled, Uttermost Salvation. Notice carefully that the word uttermost, the salvation, is connected directly with the fact that he ever liveth. So therefore, the salvation that we're preaching about this morning is connected with the living Christ, seated at the right hand of the Father. Now, I've preached to you time and time and time again how that the new birth is an event that takes place once in your life when you are born of the Spirit of the living God, and by that you become a son of God. That cannot change. But the salvation as referred to here in the book of Hebrews chapter number 7 and verse number 25 is the salvation of your living soul day in and day out to bring you to that appointed time when you meet in the presence of the Lord. He's living to see to it that what is needful in your life is ministered to you by the grace of God. Therefore, it becomes an uttermost salvation. The Greek word panteles is translated uttermost here. It's a conjunction of pos and telos. Pos means any and all. In other words, everything related to your salvation. And the word telos means to be brought to the very end. In absolute, complete consummation, everything that you need in order to be saved is provided by the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. You need to be saved from the world. First John chapter number 2 verse 16, it talks about the two lusts and pride. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. This is what drives the world. This is the energy of its life. This is the object of its affection. The lust of the flesh is a monster that will consume you. The lust of the eyes will enslave you. And the pride of life will harden you to Almighty God. There's a progression to this. The flesh, the fleshly mind, the addicted body, the corrupted soul. You can always tell when you've fallen into something that has become your God and has more power over you than you have power. That's the power of sin is its ability to deceive, make you think you can enjoy it without it enjoying you. You eat it, but it will wind up eating you. It leads to the lust of the eyes, the all-demanding desire to have more and more, but never satisfied. It leads to the pride of life. I will take what I want. I will destroy all in my path. I will enjoy all life has to offer. For I am worthy. For I am me. For I am better than you. Darwin said it well when he said the survival of the fittest. I am simply living out my superior self over you. I'm wonderful. I love me. That is the pride of life. And that is what permeates life and the church that is preached from the pulpits today. The lust of the flesh, 
the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. The driving force of this world is not limited to the pagan, agnostic, atheist. It finds its way into the religious world. The lust of the flesh is satisfied on a different level. The flesh is much more subtle and sophisticated than given credit. The lust of the eyes see ever so clearly the things to be gained in religion. The pride of life enjoys the recognition of religious rank and authority. Christ rejected wealth. He rejected recognition. He rejected authority as only it came to him. By the scripture, the word of God. He did not come to start a new religion, but to fulfill the divine revelation and the truth as to who he is. You need to be saved from the world and you need to be saved from the devil. Satan is smarter than you. Satan is stronger than you. Satan has far more experience than you have. Satan has a vast array at his disposal. He has a past and a future. And you are no match for Satan. Oh, but preacher, 1 John 4, 4 says, Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Yes, amen. But who is in you? The old man or the new man? The Bible says to put off the old man and to put on the new man. Ephesians chapter number 4 and verse 22 says that you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust and be renewed in the spirit of your mind that you put on the new man which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. The Greek word translated put off is apotithemi which means to renounce. How do I put off the old man? I renounce the old man. When the accuser of the brethren comes to me and says that it's all in my mind, that it was nothing but an emotional experience, I say back to him, Satan, I am not what I used to be. I am a new creature in Christ Jesus. The blood has cleansed my sins away. I renounce you. I deny you. I reject you. You are not my God. From this day forward, a renouncing has taken a position. When you renounce something, you say, I am by the grace of God who I am. I've been born again. I've been saved. I've been washed in the blood of the Son of the living God. To renounce is to take a position. To renounce is to declare who you are. To renounce is to bring to a confrontation you and Satan and say to him, you are not my God anymore. To renounce therefore is to put off the old man. It's not to coddle him. It's not to please him. It's not to make peace with him. You can never make peace with a flesh. There is never a place of peace. It is to bring him before you and nail him to a cross. The Bible said we have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts thereof. The only place for your flesh, the only place for the old man is to be nailed to a tree. Amen. Amen. There's never a peace to be found with him. And so the devil... Sure he'll have you quote, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. One of the worst things about quoting the Bible is when you quote it from your head and let the words flow out of your mouth, but it doesn't come forth from the heart. If it doesn't come forth from the heart, you don't cling to it. You don't embrace it. You don't believe it. It doesn't affect your life. It has no change in who you are. So therefore, it's only coming from the brain, from the head. And my friend, by doing that, it becomes null and void. You become, you become jaded to the truth. We call it gospel hardened. You hear, you hear, you hear. Week after week after week, you take in the word of God, but you process it in your mind and you let it flip and fly away quickly. It's got to reach the heart. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Amen. Who's in you? If it's Christ in you, the hope of glory, there's power in you. If it's the risen Lord Jesus Christ, he has already made us show them openly and triumphed over them. If it is the blood of Christ that you cling to as your righteousness and your strength, that all the thing has changed that's necessary for your victory in this world. You put on the new man. What does the word poop, the word put on is from the Greek word in duo. It means to clothe yourself with the new man. So the old man is renounced and the new man is put on. How do you clothe yourself? That's a good question. How would I clothe myself? <coughs> All of you this morning, 
Before you came to this house, you clothed yourself. You put something on. The reason an animal doesn't clothe itself is because it's not made in the image of God. It wasn't made, my friend, in the image of God. When God made Adam and Eve, he put them in the garden. He gave them clothing. What was that, preacher? It was a primeval glory that covered them. They were not seen from everything about them. They took it for granted, but what God had done was provide for them from his own glory, a covering that covered his creation that was made in his image. But the very moment that Adam sinned against God, the very moment he rebelled against the commandment of the Lord, the Bible says they realized that they were naked. And the first thing they did was to go out and find fig leaves and soak them together to, together to cover their nakedness. Fig leaves in the Bible, therefore, forevermore stands as man's attempt to cover his nakedness, to cover his shame, to cover the part that God had already covered. It's man trying to cover what only God can. And the Bible said when the Lord came to them, he brought coats of, she of, of a skins of a sheep, of a lamb, and he brought that where blood had been shed, where something's life had been given. And then he could come and cover them with this, but it was never the same. For when they lost that glory, they lost it. The apostle Paul says, I would to be covered. He said, I don't want to be clothed upon, but to be clothed. He said, when I leave this world, I don't want to leave this world simply as a spirit that goes out into the presence of God. I want something waiting for me when I get there. And God said, there's a house in heaven, a house in the heavens that is eternal in the heavens, not made with the hands of men. And that will be our home to clothe us. There's something about us that's different from the animal. The animal is con isn't even conscious of the fact that he's not clothed, but you are. You are. You want something to cover you up. You want to cover up your nakedness. You don't want to show it to people because there's still in you that innate thought, that, that idea, that graciousness from God, that you're a creature made in the image of God. And so the Bible says now that you've put off the old man, that you've renounced what you used to be, you put on the new man. You wrap yourself up in something that's different. You cover yourself with something that's greater. You cover yourself with something that covers your nakedness. Well, I tell you this morning, the only thing that can cover your sin is the blood of Jesus Christ. And the only coat that I want to wear is the coat of righteousness of His righteousness, not mine. I will not parade my flesh in front of you. I will not parade my righteousness in front of you. I will not parade my ability in front of you. Glory to God. Hallelujah. I will Christ in him and him alone that's all I care that you see today not me but him amen and so how do you clothe yourself? First of all, you agree with God. You get down to the nitty gritty of who you are and what you are and what makes you tick. Here's the proud Pharisee that stood by Stephen as they stoned him to death. And the Bible says they cast their coats at this young man's feet. The same one once he was born again. He said, I am of all the sinners on this earth. Chief, I'm the chiefest of sinners. Here's a man who understood his nature and his essence. He realized that he needed somebody a whole lot bigger than him. That's part of clothing yourself. It's the idea that you can't do anything about your sinful condition. By the grace of God, I am what I am. So therefore, you agree with God. Secondly, you don't trust yourself. You don't trust yourself at all. That fleshly mind that you're listening to me with me right now is processing my words. Your fleshly mind is taking what I'm saying and processing it in your head. But what you don't realize is that fleshly mind has been brainwashed by an ungodly world. This ungodly Bible-denying, Christ-rejecting world has infiltrated your mind to where you think like they think. You've processed spiritual truth the way they do. And that is the reason that you don't receive from the Lord. The Bible said, therefore, let this mind be in you. This helmet of salvation, the apostle says to put on, has to do with the way you think. I will not have this world dictate to me definitions and terms. It will not define holiness to me. It will not define righteousness to me. It will not define salvation to me. Glory to God. I will let the word of God define these things to me. It will not dictate to me how I think. This blessed book will tell me how to think. Amen. So therefore, 
This fleshly mind will reject the truths that I give you. This fleshly mind will deny what I'm saying to you. And my fleshly mind is as sorry and corrupt as your fleshly mind. I want the mind of Christ. Let this mind be in you which was in Christ Jesus, who being the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but took upon himself the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. I want you to know, my friend, I want the grace of God to let me die and him live. I diminish and he's glorified. My name leaves and his is exalted. That'll help you put on. Not only that, but you pray for discernment. Religion in America is a mixture of Buddhism, Christianity, hedonism, and secularism. And who have any more isms you want to throw in there, pile them all in the pot. It makes no difference. They all stink. Christianity in America is an amalgamated mongrel association of garbage. Amen. It's a shame and a disgrace at what calls itself Christian in this country. I read a long list yesterday of apostates who denied the virgin birth, the blood atonement, said Joseph was the father of Jesus, and God help us, Steve, I wouldn't even, even say it, what they said Christ was. Some of the things that John Lennon said about the Lord Jesus Christ, stuff like that. And let me tell you something, folks. Apostasy is apostasy. You better watch how you're thinking. Well, I just like good moral programs on TV. I like absolute righteousness from the Word. What's the difference between morality and righteousness? My righteousness comes forth from the divine. Morality is man's attempt to pull himself up by his bootstraps and make himself look better in the sight of other men. And God has rejected all of it. The Bible said, try the spirits. I got on a web page a couple of days ago, highly recommended by some, talking about how spiritual it was. I got on that web page and looked from top to bottom. Oh, they said a lot about God. They said a lot about the spirits. They said a lot about spiritual things and the vision they had for the world. And I kept saying, where's Jesus? Where's Jesus? Where's he at in all this? Where's Jesus? Hey, where's Jesus? Hey, where's Jesus? He wasn't in it. Had no part of it. It was all a man-made piece of garbage. Try the spirit. The red flags popped up. If they're not glorifying the blessed Lamb of God, they came straight out of the pit. I don't care if they came out of the Baptist church, Methodist church, where they came from. If it doesn't glorify the Lord Jesus Christ, you can have it. I'll give it to you for nothing. Free of charge. It's not even worth the paper it's stamped on. Garbage. But you got to try them. So, it's all about who? Preacher Lawson, that's what it's not, not about me. Well, it's about Baptist heritage. Not really, no, it's not about that. Well, it's all about how the Baptist church and the Christian church has affected America. And our heritage is in this, really not about that. You say, well, well it's about my growth in the Lord. No, it's really not even about that. Well, it's about, what's it about, preacher? It's about him. It's about him. It's about him. That's all it's ever been about. That's all it'll ever be about. Do you understand everything of God's creation only has meaning, it only has essence, and it only has a future in the name of Jesus? you realize that everything God's ever going to do for a man, now, past, present, and future, is in the name of Jesus? you realize that God has put power in that name above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess? you realize that He has the beauty of holiness, and that's a beauty compared to the beauty of this world? This beauty fades like a tar pit compared to the beauty of holiness? you realize that He's the only righteous one that ever walked the face of this earth and the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ is the righteousness of a man who lived a sinless perfect life and that righteousness becomes your righteousness when you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ you realize that every soul that ever walked the face of this earth lives breathes it's going to die one day from dust thou art and to dust thou shalt return and if a soul ever goes any higher than dust it'll go through the Lord Jesus Christ who is the resurrection and the life everything else that ever existed is corruption it's all death it's all damnation there is no hope and no future outside of the Lord Jesus Christ. You realize that your sins condemn you. Your sins are a burden to you. You can't bear. You can't do anything about it. You can't get it off of you. You can't cleanse yourself. You can brainwash your mind, think you're better. It's not going to change a thing. But let Jesus Christ touch you one time with his precious blood and he'll wash your sins away. Amen. He is to a sinner, my friend, life love, liberty, hope, peace, happiness, joy, and the future. He is the greatest thing that ever happened for a sinner. You say, well, a preacher, I want to meet one of these sinners you're talking about. Go home and look in the mirror. Take a good 
have long look. I got in front of a mirror yesterday. I usually try to avoid them, but this time I looked into it. And when I looked into that mirror, I looked at those two eyes looking at me. And I said this, and God's my witness, I don't trust you. <laughs> Just like that. That's the truth. I wouldn't lie in God's church. I stood right in front of that mirror and I said, I don't trust you. I trust Jesus. Amen. Jesus, deliver me from me. Hallelujah. He's the Savior of mankind. That includes me. There's no hope outside Him. He's the beauty of God, the glory of God, the grace of God, the peace of God, the mercy of God. He's all of it wrapped up in one person. That's why we sing about Him. That's why we preach about Him. That's why we pray to Him. That's why we talk about Him. There's nobody like Jesus. Amen. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Oh, how precious is that name. It'll become precious to you when your life ebbs away. It'll become precious to you when tragedy comes. It'll become precious to you when you really need something spiritual for your soul. I would that you get on the web page and start reading some of these prayer requests I've been getting the last few days. Some of them will break your heart. Some of them will put you on your knees praying. I get prayer requests from people who are in broken, desperate need. And folks, it drives me to my knees to pray for these folks. They're looking for somebody who cares. I get prayer requests from all over America, all over the world. And they log into that web page and type in their prayer request. And how sad. This past week, one wrote in and said, Preacher, I'm glad you're saved. Uh, paraphrase him. He said, That's all fine, well, and good. He said, I can't be saved. He said, I prayed, asked God to save me. It didn't work. I've tried to follow the Lord. It didn't do any good. I've tried this, tried that, and I'm still unsaved. I'm just not one of the elect. First thing I thought of was Calvin. First thing I thought of was his putrefying, an abominable corruption of the Word of God. The first thing I thought of was that crowd that gets up and tells you only the elect are going to be saved. When Christ went to the cross, he tasted death for me, you, and every soul that ever lived. I would that he'd watch this. I would that he'd understand. It makes no difference what his sin is. The blood of Christ cleanses from all sin. I wouldn't understand that. And that John Calvin, and I don't care what you think about it, was a maniac. And John Calvin was personally responsible for having a man burned the stake. Michael Servetus. Look it up. It's history. This man that's praised to high heaven as the greatest thing that ever happened was one of the worst monsters that ever lived when it come to some of his doctrine that he's preaching and spewing out from pulpits today. Are you low down? You can be saved. Are you a murderer? You can be saved. Are you a rapist? You can be saved. Are you a killer? You can be saved. Are you a thief? You can be saved. Are you an adulterer? You can be saved. I'm an assassin preacher. You can be saved. The grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust. That grace is for me and that grace is for you. Hallelujah. John the Baptist said it well. Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the elect. Is that wrong? That doesn't even sound right, does it? That's a bunch of garbage. Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Blessed be his holy name. Father, in Jesus' name, I have said what you put on my heart to say. Lord, I want them to get a hold of thee and not me. I want them to be filled with thee and not me. I want them to walk out of this house this morning impressed with thee and not me. I can't do a thing for them, Lord. I just simply bring the message. But God, you can do all things. In Jesus' sweet holy name I pray. For Jesus' sake I ask it. Bless the Lamb of God. Amen. Let's stand up this morning, brother. What do we got? Page 306 in your all
come. Janice, on the front page of this little booklet, you have two different children? Okay, because I noticed the affliction in their left leg. So it's the same child. All right. Why don't you come by and look at these little faces right here? These little kids were born into poverty, grinding poverty, with no hope really of ever having anything except by the grace of God. Okay? We go back out into our comforts, into America, you know, and you think, well, does God love them, preacher? How many think God loves these, these little kids here? I wonder if they fit in Calvin's theology. Does God love them? Yes, he loves them. Yes, he does. You see, when the gospel comes into a people, it immediately starts setting them free, making them free, liberating them. But another benefit of the gospel is he starts healing. Healing. Miracles are performed. That all comes with it. By his stripes, we were healed. You see? Deliverance. This salvation that I preached about to you this morning, I didn't even talk about that part of it, but that's part of it. To save to the uttermost means every possible scenario of salvation that applies to the believer is yours through the finished work of Christ. Now, of course, does he heal everybody? Well, of course, you get into different that's different studies, different Bible studies altogether when it comes to that. But I'm going to tell you this right now. He, he, he heals a bunch of people. I've watched children. I've watched holes in hearts being closed up. I've watched them raised up time and time and time again by the power of God. So is there a benefit to preaching the gospel? Absolutely. Because it brings the light and brings salvation. And without it, there's nothing but ignorance and damnation. We'll have a word of prayer and we'll let you go. Don't forget the Therese family today. Pray for the family. Pray for his mother. And we'll meet again this evening, 6 o'clock, for the evening service. Y'all keep that in mind. We'll meet again Wednesday night, 7 o'clock, for prayer meeting. Pray for Tom Berry. He's on his way back. She said he'll be back tomorrow evening. I'm tickled to death to hear that he made it a whole week and didn't have any or however long he's been down there and had any trouble with his head. I'm glad to hear that. That's an answer to prayer. Amen. Brother Robert Gibson, will you dismiss us, please? Lord Jesus, once again, God, you spoke to us. Without Lord, your sweet spirit, God has moved throughout the crowd this morning. God, this message, God, the power of this message, God, that you said. Lord, let me that one, God, that Satan, Lord, is trying to pull away. But yet, Lord, your spirit, God, is touching that heart, drawing them to yourself. Oh, we pray that love, God, extend itself. <clears throat> God, maybe this evening, sometime, some more along the way, before it's too late, they'll cry out to this Jesus that's been preached about this morning. Say, I'm the one, Lord, save my soul. God, we'll glorify your name for it, Lord. God, there's been requests that's been made this morning. God, we lift them up to you. You know how to touch them. You know how it works. Most of all, Lord, we thank you for Jesus, that precious blood that was shed on Calvary. Yes. Lord, it wasn't for that blood, God, we'd all be in hell. Thank you, Lord, for saving old sinners like me. We glorify your sweet name, give you all the honor and all the glory. This is your precious name. Lord, we pray and ask these things. Amen and amen.